So what I'm talking about is grammar, logic, and rhetoric, chiefly. This triad of mental disciplines was traditionally called the trivium, and uh, thankfully it persists as a meme of sorts today, since it's being proven time and time again to be the cornerstone of a rational man or woman. Now, the idea behind spreading this modern manifestation of the trivium as a meme has been to give people a way out of the old Prussian outcome-based education system that they were raised in. Uh, and then it's to get them onto the same level of education that the children of, say, wealthy elites have been getting for millennia, uh, namely a classical private school education. The logic is that this two-tiered education system leads to, on the one hand, uh, a dumbed-down populace who will do well to work a slavish job as a top-right screw uh, once they come of age, and then on the other hand, a uh, ruling elite who have the smarts and the bullshit detectors not to get duped into being someone else's servant. So what the trivium is, essentially, is a systematic methodology for critical thinking. Its purpose is to derive factual certainty regarding the imprints received by the traditional five senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. Basically, this is a, a glorified bullshit detector that you run as a software in your mind. Etymologically, the word trivium means the place where three roads meet, uh, tres via. In medieval universities, this was the lower division of the seven liberal arts. Uh, it comprised of grammar, logic, and rhetoric in that order. Uh, for you computer folk, you'll understand this more easily as input, process, and output. This uh, triad of disciplines then was foundational for the quadrivium, and that's the upper division of a classical education in the liberal arts, and that comprised arithmetic, which is the study of number, geometry, which is the study of number in space, music, which is the study of number in time, and astronomy, which is number in space and time. Um, now, I've heard it said many times before, you've got to respect existence or expect resistance. And what respecting existence really is, is having your grammar in line, the way you conjure up your data. You also have to have your logic in line, the way you analyze your data. And then you have your rhetoric in line, and that's the way you represent that data to other people. Now, something I want to mention right away about the trivium is that it is ultimately more descriptive than it is prescriptive. The trivium essentially just tells you how it all works. It's, it's a map, if you will, rather than a, a set of instructions. Um, now, that being said, grammar, logic, and rhetoric were still essential parts to a functional education, and this was first explained in Plato's dialogues. But I think what Plato would have said is that an education is not an imposition of external facts on an ignorant disciple, but rather a coaxing out of what they already knew, but hadn't been able to communicate it yet. The information, Plato believed, was all there, in the realm of forms, in some sort of Akashic record, if you want to go there. It just needs to be conjured down to earth by way of dialectic, which is another word for logic. Remember that the great exhortation of the Delphic Oracle was to know thyself, and I think understanding the trivium is key to this. Now, 
if Brett Bartlett were here in the studio with me today, he would have had this to say, and I don't necessarily disagree. The problem with crediting the Trivium to Plato is that what he ultimately did was add his own set of assumptions to a model that had already had somewhat of a, a brief history. Um, he'd argue that the forms are not at the conceptual foundation of the Trivium's disciplines, but more of an adornment that is only excised after the fact and with difficulty. We can reason a whole lot of things without having recourse to additional evidence, and it's merely because we begin our education with much of that information having already been instilled in us at an earlier age, not due to some transcendental realm of forms. Furthermore, grammar, uh, with Plato's conception of the forms, flies in the face of all of our modern understanding of linguistics, uh, wherein languages are seen as far more fluid and organic than, than rigid or, or formal. So to make a long story short, Brett would say that I'm giving Plato's philosophy too much credit in academia. And of course, he would be aware of the irony of that statement. But overall, he'd say that Plato is really just lucky to see his work preserved and be on the popular side of the debate. But in any case, I digress. At a much later period, this concept of the trivium was implicit to the denuptiis Philologiae et Mercurii, on the marriage of philosophy and Hermes, by Martianus Capella, uh, a great Hermeticist and Neoplatonic philosopher of late antiquity, when he finally coined the term to match the earlier quadrivium. So let's not forget the types of people who created this system of thought and give credit where credit is due. These types of people are often blamed for being overly speculative. Uh, but from Capella to Comenius and beyond, Bruno, these types of guys, Hermeticists' educational methods were very sound, uh, even at affecting change in the so-called real world. So, in her book entitled In the Trivium, The Liberal Arts of Logic, Grammar, and Rhetoric, uh, Miriam Joseph describes the trivium like this. And I think that this is a, a very apt description. Grammar is the art of inventing symbols and combining them to express thought. Logic is the art of thinking. And rhetoric is the art of communicating thought from one mind to another. The adaptation of language to circumstance. Grammar is concerned with the thing as it is symbolized. Logic is concerned with the thing as it is known. And then rhetoric is concerned with the thing as it is communicated. So the idea is this. And let's go slowly, step by step. Let's say you begin life as a sort of tabula rasa, a blank slate, which is not exactly the case since we're all coded by our genes, but let's imagine for the sake of, of learning. The whole world in your perception is this unified blob of experience. You're just moving through life on instinct, swayed by your hunger and your thirst, and as you start to get older, you start to make sense of the world. As you play and interact with this great unified blob of experience, people start coming up to you and delineating specific objects. They tell you, this is a ball, or this is food. Over time, you begin to amass this huge internal dictionary, and you begin to delineate your own world. You set up boundaries. You even begin to differentiate between the world out there and the world in here, imagining them to be a separate thing. 
So now you're swimming in an ocean of experience, but also in an ocean of words. You start to conflate the symbol and the reality. You start to mix up the thing in and of itself with the word for the thing. And from that point on, your descent into madness begins. Your forced compromise, as Manly P. Hall once said, makes you at one with the grand mistakes of mankind. Now, at this point, your ability to learn words is quite amazing. You've got a much higher degree of neuroplasticity at work between your ears than most people around you, and you're just crawling around on the floor, soaking up sensations like a sponge. Well, soon enough, you've long passed just screaming and crying to get your way. You've even stopped grunting nouns and started chaining them together with verbs. Life begins to initiate you into the great mystery of grammar. You start using your words to your advantage. No longer are you screaming senselessly to get things done. Uh, you've discovered the power of asking. You realize very quickly that in this great game we all play, words can get you out of all sorts of trouble. Shaping the right sounds with your mouth can get you anything you want, you start to realize. But your grasp on that word magic is tenuous at best, and thus your power is limited. What you start to notice is that some of the sentences you're using actually get more results than others. Uh, you may even begin to start telling lies. This is a period in life where many undesirable traits are born. Uh, we discover from an earlier age that negative stimuli are more likely to get a result than just being nice. Uh, and, and in this way, the onus of a person's shittiness is really as much the fault of the audience as it is the speakers. So, right. You discover that some sentences are very powerful indeed. If you're cold, you can ask for warmth. If you're hungry, you can ask for food. If you're lonely or bored, you can ask for attention. Uh, but as the world around you complexifies and your desires proliferate, you start to weave more and more elaborate sentences to achieve more and more freedom. Freedom from and freedom to. Your ability to work with the mechanics of language itself begins having a notable effect on your freedom. As people around you begin conflating your newly acquired verbal proficiency with maturity. The truth is, you're still coming to terms with this new superimposed linguistic reality. This is a tree. This is a bush. This is a flower, this is a petal, and so forth. Remember, grammar is concerned with the thing as it is symbolized. Now, something you realize very quickly is that the more carefully your words coincide with the way everyone perceives things, uh, what I call consensus reality, the more effective your communication is. The more effective the communication, the more powerful the communicator. But not only that, on the flip side, you start to notice that the more you appeal to people's emotions, the more you touch people on a subjective level, the more power you gain as well. Well, both of these avenues, appeals to reason and appeals to emotion, are means to power, and, and power, at least as I see it, is but a means to freedom the freedom from restraint, and the freedom to externalize the mind, or to do what thou wilt, as we say. Now, very quickly, you start to notice that emotional manipulation can very easily backfire. Since you're not playing with anything nailed down in consensus reality, you're largely playing with a loaded ideological rifle. 
You notice that you can do a great deal of good working on the emotional circuit, but you can also do a lot of damage. Some people fall so far off the path of balance between the heart and the intellect that they fall into solipsism on one hand or ruthless and intolerable absolutism on the other. We see this everywhere today. Some people babble clusters of New Age nonsense, and people just throw money at them, and then other people sprout nothing but hardcore empirical data, making them intolerably prickly people, but they too gain great respect in matters of science and economics, etc., beating other types of people to throw money at them. Now, what you start to notice is that the truths which we can all agree upon 2 plus 2 equals 4, that sort of thing. These facts don't hurt anyone. In fact, they're quite constructive. When enough people can get together and agree on a good set of facts, they can put something like the Hubble telescope in the sky or build the pyramids. You can rarely go wrong with the truth. It's simple, elegant, and once it's been said so as to be understood, it's understood. So you start to prize this understanding. There is much more power in affecting consensus reality through reason than there is through emotion. Once you grasp this fact that all our subjective mental universes delight in and rotate around some sort of axis of truth or consensus reality, you start to make use of it. You start moving away from purely using your powers of perception, and you start trying to organize the world by mathematical analogies. And by doing so, you've graduated to the next step of your education out of ignorance. You've reached the stage of the trivium called logic, which is built on a firm foundation of grammar. When you speak, the nouns you use agree in case, gender, and number in order to elucidate specifics. Uh, you've got subjects, objects, and verbs all stringed together in coherent fashion, and your ability to be purely descriptive is activated. Well, descriptive is not good enough for our purposes, because we, hermeticists, are co-creators with God, or the One, or the Universe, or whatever you want to call it. We want to make that which is above as that which is below. We want to do the great work and, and work toward making the material world correspond to the perfection of the ideal world. Well, we can pillow sit all day and meditate our way to freedom, having effected no actual change outside of our own minds, or we can actually practice our freedom and live in truth amidst the world. We can apply our reason constructively. So just before we move on, I, I want to mention that if you really want to understand grammar, the only thing you can really do is go and learn a language other than your own. Usually you can't see the forest for the trees if you try to break down your own language without an external point of reference. But I suppose this could be done. Uh, I'm not saying you need to take four years off to go learn classical Latin or ancient Greek or anything like that. But seriously, go learn another language if you haven't already. It will vastly improve your understanding of grammar and, of course, that's the least of its potential benefits. Uh, Alright, so, so moving on. Let's talk about logic, uh, the way you analyze your data, which of course has now been dutifully collected and is ready to be processed on account of your strong grasp of grammar. Uh, logic was formalized as a discipline by Aristotle, a, a disciple of Plato's, at, at least as far as the Western tradition is concerned. In the East, uh, Hindus, Jains, and Buddhists led the charge in the development of logic as a formal discipline. I think most people today would find it ironic that logic was a discipline that grew out of more, let's say, spiritual traditions, uh, but most people today 
are historically illiterate at best or foolish at worst. So that explains that. Now, logic is the art of thinking. It's concerned with the thing as it is known. Sometimes we call this discipline dialectic, which is really the mechanism by which thought and analysis function. This is a process of identifying fallacious arguments and statements, and thus systematically rooting out contradictions, thereby producing factual knowledge that can be trusted. No longer is the data colored by emotions or knee-jerk reactions. We've reasoned our way to a truth which is not always purely evident to the senses. Now, inherent to logic is this platonic idea that the form or the shape or the architectural structure of a statement is more important than its actual contents. We've discussed this at length in previous lectures, just as Plato believed that all things and manifestation are but copies of true and eternal forms which are invisible to sense perception and accessible by the intellect alone, so too did people start to begin thinking that thoughts made up of words adhered to the same process. The idea was that truth was truth regardless of whether it came in the form of mathematical equations or in the form of sentences. Ultimately, these two were thought to be the same and people started treating them as such. So what they did is they started coming up with shapes of arguments, which they denoted with the use of symbols with interchangeable meanings. Uh, a classical example of this is as follows, and I apologize if you've heard this a thousand times before. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. So this is what we call a syllogism, which is the Greek word for inference. This is a kind of logical argument that makes use of deductive reasoning to come to a conclusion based on two or more propositions that are assumed to be true. This whole process was first defined by Aristotle, who we'll come to in a few lectures, as the result of a combination of a general statement, uh, aka a major premise, and a specific statement, uh, the minor premise, with a conclusion deduced afterwards. So since we're all quite aware that all men are mortal, um, so this will be our major premise, and that, of course, Socrates is a man, our minor premise, it's safe to conclude that, in fact, Socrates is mortal. So now, if we wanted to express this truth in a quasi-mathematical form in order to see its underlying bone structure rather than seeing the makeup that's painted on, we could strip it down to this. The major premise. All M are P. The minor premise. All S are M. The conclusion. All S are P. And so on and so forth. This is what we mean when we say formal logic. Not because officious authoritarians practice it, but because it's concerned with form above everything else. Now, obviously, I'm just scratching the surface here. I'm not going to harass you with examples because, uh, as my friends who studied formal logic will tell you, it's more entertaining to watch paint dry. If you care that much about logic, go study math, learn some computer programming, or go read some analytical philosophy books by Bertrand Russell or some other gentleman of his magnificent, albeit brutally recondite, ilk. What's important here is to recognize the movement of raw sensory impressions, of raw data, the type of stuff you drown in as a baby, and or while on psychedelic drugs. 
I want you to understand how sensory impressions cascade into you, are sorted, filed, and organized according to the word symbols which we've inherited to map out those impressions. These sensory impressions, now tiled over by language in the grammar department, if you will, now pass into your logical faculties, where they can be analyzed in their formal natures. The processed data now passes through the mind while it gets checked out by quality control. Uh, that is the elf machines in your brain that match the new data to the eternal, unchanging, and immutable forms. Here they check the data for fallacies. Now, there are as many fallacies as there are grains of sand on this planet. A fallacy occurs when there's a mistake in the form of an argument. It's like this. It's like if some wizard one day came up to you and conjured up this glowing triangle saying, Behold my argument. But then, upon close examination, you realize that the triangle's angles don't really add up to 180 degrees. You say, Why? My good wizard friend, it seems you think you've got a triangle here, but in fact its angles don't add up. You've made a mistake somewhere in your reasoning. Well, if he has any intention to convince you of his point of view, or even better, to align himself to the truth, he'll go home and re-examine his magical holographic triangle to see where he made a mistake. Well, we can do the same thing with our friends, with our family, with Jehovah's Witnesses, with talking heads on TV, and so forth. When they walk up to us and conjure their arguments, our reason, our logic, acts uh, kind of like that toy which toddlers play with. You know, the kind uh, whereby they're forced to match various colored shapes with corresponding colored holes? Well, the quicker we are to detect the irregularities in the shapes of arguments, the less likely anyone is to pollute us with their faulty discourse. Being free from error, then, the more quote-unquote freedom from will have. Because, let's face it, most people, uh, myself included, unless I'm being extremely careful, have verbal diarrhea when it comes to fallacies. And we aren't doing it on purpose, we're just being emotional, we're, we're being human. Um, and of course, it's human to make mistakes. You could sit down with a friend and literally parse any great speech, uh, any great piece of literature, or anything that isn't a, a treatise on analytical philosophy or mathematics, and you could distill it down to a bunch of incoherent nonsense. But this isn't what I'm trying to get you to do. That's what I call being a fedora-wearing neckbeard, to use a fallacious ad hominem attack. I'm not trying to jade you. What I want you to realize is that, although Hanlon's razor should be in effect most of the time, uh, that is, we shouldn't attribute to malice what can more readily be attributed to stupidity, the truth is, psychopaths, manipulators, snake oil salesmen, lobbyists, politicians, pimps, lawyers, bankers, corrupt doctors, marketing firms, and even school teachers, they all have their own agendas. They will all lie through their teeth to get themselves an advantage, a pawn, or a couple bucks. People need to be in constant vigilance against manipulation, and the best weapon against that is a well-oiled brain, uh, a mind that consciously works through the steps of the trivium before accepting anything. If you benefit from the awareness of the trivium, not only do you have the power to use magic words like no, but you'll also live with a good deal less cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is our enemy. It's a sort of painful existential confusion that arises when you hold two 
mutually exclusive ideas in your mind at once without trying to accept one and reject the other or trying to come to some sort of synthesis. A common source of cognitive dissonance, for example, is when one denies the existence of evolution on the one hand, holding to a literal interpretation of the seven-day creation story in the Bible, but then also puts one's faith in antibiotics and all other wonders of modern biomedicine in which the reality of evolution is implicit to every pill, every experiment, every study. This person will either come up with some sort of a synthesis to deal with the problem, uh, microevolution is real, but macroevolution is not, uh, whatever that means, or let's say God used evolution as his means of production, which is a far more tolerable middle ground. Because if you don't do that, you're in for a world of pain. Uh, cognitive dissonance is a compass. It's there to guide you. It's your intuition speaking to you, asking you to look into something because the mind is tired of playing games with itself. It's thirsty for truth alone. Okay, so I digress. I'd like to get back to the concept of fallacies and give you a few examples of what some of these might look like. And this is in no way an exhaustive list. Now, I mentioned how there are formal fallacies and these occur when there's a break in the form of a statement. But even before those, we can have fallacies at the level of grammar. Sometimes internal dictionaries don't align and people are talking past each other, or they're making use of the wrong words, or the arguer doesn't have the capacity to express themselves. It was Aristotle who first systematized these errors into a list in his sophistical refutations. Um, <clears throat> the Latin name for it is De Sophisticis Elenchis. Um, it's in this book where he identified 13 fallacies. He divided them up into two types, those depending on language, that is, those arguments which failed at the level of grammar, and then those not depending on language, those which failed at the level of logic. These fallacies are called verbal fallacies and material fallacies, respectively. Uh, a material fallacy is an error in what the arguer is talking about, while a verbal fallacy is an error in how the arguer is talking. Uh, we needn't get all mixed up in these categories, however. We have a very simple way to describe a fallacy given to us by Richard Waitley, who defines a fallacy very concisely as any argument or apparent argument which professes to be decisive of the matter at hand, while in reality it is not. Now, as a little side rant of sorts, uh, I find that these days it's comedians who are our most notorious publicly fallacious reasoners, because ultimately they're, they're in it for the laughs. Um, this is a, a bit disconcerting to me, however, since most people these days look up to comedians for advice and for raw social commentary. People cite comedians all the time these days. Hell, I, I cited Bill Hicks a while back, and this is fine, so long as people don't equate truth with what gets the most laughs. I, I, I love the comedy of George Carlin, you know, Louis C.K., Joe Rogan, um, but just because somebody denigrates another person's point of view for some laughs doesn't mean they're right. Uh, comedians are often the masters of fallacy, and that's literally why they're funny. They violate social order by postulating nonsense, and this breaks our sense of how things ought to be, making us laugh or, you know, traumatizing us if we're soft, doughy puds. Now, my problem is that irony, sarcasm, and satire have taken this, like, weird seat of authority in 21st century postmodern hipsterdom, and it kind of creeps me out how quickly people are to dismiss anything that's been poked any fun at by, you know, Family Guy, or South Park, or anyone. Um, 
let's just not forget that it, it was the comic playwright Aristophanes who, thanks to his goofy character he made in his hilarious play The Clouds, uh, had a big role to play in causing Athens to put Socrates to trial for impiety and corrupting the youth. Now, I'm going on a tangent here, but all I'm saying is don't look to the poets for a concrete way to live your life. And if you don't know why, then I suggest you go back through my material and find out why it was Plato wanted to kick out the poets of his Republic. It's because they live in a world of words. A world of mimesis of mimesis. And the philosopher is trying to cut through these, trying to get back to the source. Okay, so here are a handful of fallacies which you'll most often encounter. Uh, the first of these is probably going to be the infamous red herring, or diverting the argument to unrelated issues. We call this a red herring argument because back in the day when hunters trained their hounds to sniff out prey, they used to take this fish, this red herring, and uh, perpendicularly slide it across the path which they knew their dog had to pass to get to its target. The intention, of course, was to try and derail the hound from his trajectory, uh, but a good dog would always stay his course instead of being distracted by the master's trap. So if ever you find yourself in an argument where your opponent is trying to divert you away from the initial debate, call his bullshit out to his face and tell him he's using a red herring to derail the argument, whether wittingly or unwittingly. Now, the second most common fallacy you may encounter is the one that I just employed against those types of people who are overly analytical at the expense of what I believe to be their humanity. I call those people fedora-wearing neckbeards. Now, notice that I didn't try to engage their modality of thinking with reasoned argument. I just dismissed them on account of their poor choice of wardrobe and personal hygiene. Now, of course, I realize this is wrong and fallacious, and that it invalidates the point I'm trying to make, which is against a way of thinking, not against a group of people. A way of thinking doesn't have bad clothes or hygiene. It's either formally true or formally fallacious. So there it is, uh, a very common fallacy, insulting someone's character, known commonly as the argumentum ad hominem, or the argument against the man. The reason this one is such a biggie is because argument is supposed to be a cooperative team endeavor to uncover the truth. It's not a game of he who yells the loudest wins, or he who has the best insults wins, or she who is most offended wins, or he who isn't the biggest loser wins, and so forth. Well, okay, maybe that last one is factually true, but let's move on. Next up, we have what's called the petitio principi, or as we say in English, begging the question, or circular reasoning. Now, the error here lies in presumption. The fallacy is assuming that your premise is already co-equivalent with your conclusion. So an example people often use to describe this to biblical literalists is this. You've got a napkin, you write. You've got a napkin, you write. This is the word of God on it. When anyone challenges you on the validity that this napkin is in fact the word of God, well, you've just got to point to the napkin and say, well, you know, this napkin says it is, and the word of God is eternal, perfect, immutable, and most importantly, infallible. So this napkin is infallible then. Then, of course, it stands to reason that this napkin is the word of God. Well, no. You see where the error lies here, right? It's in the very form of the statement. There is a presumption from the very start, the napkin is the word of God, and then we just extend that to the conclusion that the napkin is the word of God. When we argue, 
when we debate, whether professionally or among friends, we're supposed to be working together. We're supposed to identify our terms so we're both on the same page, and that page should be, for the most part, blank. Don't bring things to the table ahead of time. Now, the next most common fallacy is called the non sequitur, meaning it does not follow, from the deponent verb sequor, I follow. More simply, we call this jumping to conclusions or making jumps in our reasoning. In its form, it looks like this. 1. If A is true, then B is true. 2. B is true. 3. Therefore, A is true. And if we want to flesh this out, or drape a little bit of skin over top of that frame, we'd say, 1. If Socrates is a philosopher, then Socrates is right about everything. 2. Socrates is right about everything. 3. Therefore, Socrates is a philosopher. So you see, in this case, the statement takes on the shape of a formal argument, but it fails to deliver on any evidence, and thus it collapses in on itself. There are a number of forms these failures can manifest themselves in, but for the most part, these fallacies are not difficult to spot. Now, here is the favorite fallacy of occultists, uh, New Agers, teleologists, and fans of the Terence McKenna time wave theory. Uh, now, of course, some of these types of people would say that there is an implicit assumption in the creation of this fallacy, which is that the past drives the present as opposed to the future pulls the present. But now, as far as we know, all of our evidence points towards the traditional view of linear time, at least governing the here and now. Uh, so this is called post hoc ergo propter hoc, which we might translate as after this, therefore because of this. This is identifying a false cause and effect. You've often heard it said that correlation does not equal causation and it's for good reasons. If you chart global warming on one axis of a graph, and then you chart the number of pirates in the world, you might see that there's a direct correlation between global warming and the decline of piracy, and therefore that global warming is the direct causal factor in the decline of the number of pirates on the high seas. Well, obviously that isn't the case, what we're really saying is, after global warming, post hoc, after this, the pirate population dwindled, therefore, ergo, the pirates must be dwindling because of, propter, global warming. Well, the fact is, the world is, is a more complicated place than that, and there are more variables at work than we can ever handle at once. What of course happened was the Industrial Revolution, the rise of nation-states who policed their own waters, making piracy more risky and less profitable, and so forth. Climate change is just one of a million variables which may or may not have had any impact on the total number of pirates in, say, the year 1860. All right. So next up, we have what's called bandwagoning. Uh, which is essentially the assertion that everyone agrees. I'm guilty of this. I find myself saying things like, I think we can all agree that, and, and then follow it up with a statement that's something we definitely don't agree on. In fact, there's very little you can get a whole room of people to agree on, except things like 2 plus 2 equals 4, or all circles are not square. I doubt you could even get a hundred people to agree that the sky is blue. But in any case, any time you hear the four magic words, we can all agree, followed by a purely subjective statement, well, you know that person is, at, at that very moment in time and space, full of shit. Next up, uh, we have my favorite fallacy, which I've spent much of my academic career hacking away at, 
And that's the fallacy of creating a false dilemma or a false dichotomy. Uh, this is the mistake of having an overly calcified Aristotelian sense of either or logic, um, in which very complex situations are oversimplified. Historians are ruthless for this, so it's really easy to spend your time as a historian going and finding statements like, it was not like X, it was like Y, and then saying, well, actually, this is a false dichotomy, and you're creating a two-dimensional epistemological cartoon by distilling the past down to either-or statements. We need to think in a more quantum manner, if you will, because that's how reality operates. It's, it's fuzzy. We need to reconcile opposites to find syntheses, or, or do away with the idea of opposites in history altogether applying maybe logic or both and logic instead. If you want an example of my own work where I do this, uh, check out the reading of the paper I did entitled Coincidencia Appositorum on the historiography of alchemy. Okay, so the next fallacy, uh, this is a big one, everyone is guilty of it, especially the news. Uh, other than their choice of words, which is in their domain of rhetoric, so to speak, the news are the absolute worst culprits of being very selective with their use of facts. This is called card stacking, and it's very difficult to see through if you're not up to date with the specifics of a field or of an issue. It's extremely easy to manipulate information in your favor disregard or denigrate all opposition, and then just chill out in the ivory tower you've made yourself. If you want to make a strong argument, and if you want to judge whether an opponent or a news anchor has a strong argument, look to see how they deal with the competition. Look to see if they even touch upon data that might run counter to their agenda. A strong and honest argument incorporates the attacks of an opponent and deals with them on a point-by-point -point basis. It doesn't try to mask issues. That's the difference between a true scholar and, say, a journalist. Not that journalists can't be true scholars. It's just that scholars make a point of reading everything there is to read about a subject and then dealing with the issues on a point-by-point -point basis. This often forms a big part of their work, this process. They are engaged in a, in a dialectical process with the literature. They don't just comb it looking for what matches their confirmation biases. If you want to make a strong argument, always be direct with your own facts and make as much of an effort to engage the evidence that your opponent might be bringing to the table. Trust me, it helps your case. All right, so next up we have the ever-popular false analogy fallacy. This happens uh, when someone is making a false or misleading comparison between two completely different things. So here's an example that I remember from my youth off the top of my head. When I was a teen, uh, I was very much into extreme heavy metal music, and, and thankfully I still am. Now, I was raised in a relatively strict Protestant home, and this habit of mine was frowned upon because of heavy metal's seemingly subversive content. Let's just say that uh, neoconservative Reagan-era satanic panic had really hit our home with a vengeance. Well, I told my folks it was uh, not all that bad, it just seemed that way on the surface, what they perceived to be the glorification of drugs, violence, war, etc., was actually just an impartial look. Very seldom were value judgments cast in heavy metal, at, at least the good stuff. So, now, of course, my folks didn't see things my way um, to my parents, even if there was an iota of questionably unwholesome material. It was all trash. So, this analogy was brought to me. Let's say... I took all the best gourmet ingredients in the world and wanted to make some brownies. 
I made sure every single ingredient was made up of the highest quality, and then I decided to sneak a little something extra inside. While making your brownie mix, though, I decided to sneak in a little nugget of dog shit. You know, just, just a little tiny bit. Surely it's dispersed throughout the, the whole brownie, and the overall quality of the brownie could not be too affected. But do you still want to eat it? Well, my answer to that was blunt and simple. Lyrical content, unlike dog shit, cannot give you a bacterial infection. Dog shit and subversive lyrics are only analogous insofar as you had an a priori assumption that these are like things, and they're not. So that's just one of a billion examples I can give. When people debate you and start venturing into the realm of analogy, and this is something I am guilty of, you, you need to look them straight in the eyes and say, this is a false analogy. I will not argue with you if you don't play by the rules of argumentation, whether formally or informally. Naturally, this is a bit abrasive on the ears of someone, especially someone unaware of their own assumptions. So, so be firm but gentle, because uh, you don't want to alienate them from the conversation. It's, it's for the good of both of you, after all. Okay, so lastly, and like I said, there are as many fallacies as there are grains of sand on the earth. So this list is in no way exhaustive. I wanted to mention the fallacy of hasty generalizations. Blanket statements are almost always wrong. How's that for a blanket statement? Uh, basically, it's because you're making a statement devoid of any evidence, um, or maybe based on two to three examples, which are by no means exhaustive. If you're going to make a claim that, let's say, all apples are delicious, well, you better have eaten every damned apple on the planet. Um, if you're going to say Jimmy Page is the best guitarist in the world ever, well, then you better be able to back that up with a working knowledge of every other guitarist on the planet, to say nothing of totally ignoring the subjectivity of taste. So, you see, when it comes to blanket generalizations, we're, we're almost always wrong. I say almost because some generalizations are true. Um, all homosexuals are attracted to members of the same sex. All circles are round. All books have pages. All lightning flashes, and so forth. We call these tautologies, and they're basically the meaningless result of a force divide in the language between subject and verb. Um, all books have pages because all books are pages. All lightning flashes because all lightning is a flash. The, the truth is that subjects' verbing is actually a linguistic illusion. In reality, all we have is verbing. We're in a boundless energy bath, and everything is in motion, flowing hither and thither. So things, that is, units of thought, like nouns, are only divisions made in the mind. Anyhow, I'm, I'm getting entirely off topic here. Just be wary of blanket generalizations when you hear them. And be conscious of your own usage of them. Now, that was a very brief and sketchy description of the second part of the Trivium. I was going to say the second step, but I realized this would betray how the Trivium operates. It's, it's more of a triangle than part of a ladder, though it, it has been conceived as a ladder by some throughout history. Each corner of the Trivium, if you will, is necessary to the functioning of each other part. It's a, it's a triune process, much akin to the flow of energies through the now fractured trinity of Sephiroth on the Kabbalistic tree of life, Chokmah, Dina, and Da'at. Which, I guess, is not a Sephiroth, but you get the idea. Now, bear with me as I get into some rather terse esoteric jargon, but if you're interested in this stuff, hear me out. Raw energy pours into the system from the crown, or keter. We language it with our experience, through wisdom, 
through chokma. We process this data then with our faculty of understanding, bina, with our logic, with our intellects. And then it passes on into knowledge, into dat, which is really the abyss that formed after the one underwent some sort of contraction, uh, what the Kabbalists called simsum, uh, which produced the universe we're now living in. Um, it's then through rhetoric that this now processed sensory data must pass through the abyss into the realm of manifestation. If you want to picture two people talking, who are of course just two nodes in the fullness of God, or as I've heard my good friend Kevin Cook say, facets on the jeweled web of Indra's net. Um, so take two trees of life, two, two of these trees of Sephiroth, and flip one of them over and have them touching at the point of Malkuth. This will be where these two uh, systems are meeting. In the material world. So then picture that pure energy flowing down out of the void, down through the boundless light, into the crown of the individual, and then down all the sephiroth in a pattern like a lightning bolt or a serpent. Notice how that energy by this point is languaged data. It passes out from one tree or one entity and into another. And while that energy is in Malkuth, it's taking the form of sound waves flowing through air molecules. These waves hit the physical, material, tympanic membranes. They convert kinetic energy to the cochlea, where it's then converted into electrical signals and shot back up the tree of the second individual, who then repeats the process but backwards. It's like God playing a game of ping pong with himself. It's a very complex back and forth process that happens virtually instantaneously. Your grammar, your logic, your rhetoric, they all need to be operating as best as possible in order to make any union of two trees a productive union working toward the truth, working towards seeing the world as it is received by Keter, the crown, not merely as it is manifest in matter, in, in Malkuth. Now, of course, in making these analogies, I could be mistaken on a few points of detail. I'm, I'm no erudite rabbi, but hopefully the general concept is clear. So this leads me to the last section of the trivium, and that's the stage of rhetoric. This is the output stage. Uh, this is the process of taking the information that was just in your skull and effectively organizing it, repackaging it, and sending it out so as to put it into someone else's skull. The five key aspects of rhetoric which outline the traditional requirements in designing a persuasive speech were first codified in Rome by an order named Quintilian. Um, my MA Latin exam was actually on this guy's handbook. Uh, these five aspects of rhetoric are invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. Invention is the process that leads to the development and refinement of an argument. This is basically your grammar and your logic. Um, then once your arguments are developed, the arrangement is used to determine how it should be organized for greatest effect. Typically, there are logical progressions in arguments that are worth following. Uh, remember, we always need to be aware of good form, something that's dangerously lacking in our day and age, especially in music. God damn, it's gotten bad. Okay, so now that the content is known and the structure is determined, the next five steps involve elocutio, uh, that is style, and pronunciatio, uh, it has presentation. Is your style simple, moderate, or florid? Uh, who's your audience? This is very important. Um, I use florid language quite a bit, especially in a format like this, which is, is more like infotainment. But if you read my academic works, 
I'm more moderate in my use of fancy words. Uh, they're only there if they need to be there. Otherwise, they're like fat that needs to be cut away. This is what style really means. Uh, when it comes to presentation, which is of utmost importance to actors, we're getting into the more physical elements of rhetoric. We're looking at the proper use of volume and pitch and phrasing and, and pace and emphasis. You always want to get the right emphasis on, on the right syllable. So presentation is also your stance. It's also your gestures, your posture, your facial expression. All these things have an unfortunately profound impact on how effectively we give and receive information. If you don't believe me, uh, get Microsoft Sam to read you my lectures and see how much you retain. Okay, so next step in rhetoric is memoria, which was written about quite extensively throughout the centuries. And so over time, as a discipline, it was the product of some very interesting mnemonic devices, like memory palaces. The great 16th century magician Giordano Bruno was particularly well known for his interest in mnemonic devices, uh, which were so effective that people thought they were a kind of sorcery. These are merely strategies to help a speaker recall everything they need to say. Um, you can look into these more on your own if you're interested. Uh, in, in this day and age, we put a lot more weight on research skills than memory, uh, just because of the sheer volume of information we're confronted with. But I think it's valuable to exercise both. Plato would lament the day that writing was invented, uh, chiefly because of the deleterious effects it would have on our memory. And, you know, I don't think he was wrong to do so either. If we consider something like a, a kipu, which was a sort of rote not based mnemonic device used extensively by the Inca instead of writing, we can see how even with just a string and some knots, people could remember vast, vast quantities of data. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was based on a binary system, which is pretty incredible for a civilization that didn't even have the wheel. Uh, you know, not that the wheel is some sort of benchmark for advanced civilization or anything. Okay, so actio, delivery. Uh, this is the final step in rhetoric, and this is all about presenting yourself to the audience in an ingratiating and pleasing way. Hand gestures, eye contact, nice clothes, that sort of thing. Um, not really the most important thing, but, but something that people put a lot of value into nevertheless. You know, you'll never see a, a grimy punk rocker reading the news on TV. It's just not going to happen. So there we have it. Rhetoric is the third and final stage of the trivium, and it's ultimately about effectively bridging the gap between one mind and another, in part through more mental activity, and then in part through the body or uh, the physical processes. I guess you could say that the trivium sort of factors into the old hard problem of consciousness, with uh, grammar and logic being stuff that happens on the level of the intellect and then rhetoric bridging the gap between the mental and the material. Now, some might debate there even is a gap, but uh, this debate will never end, and I'm not really smart enough to add much to it. My position is that there are some things which we will never understand, uh, though that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. To me, a human truly coming to understand his own consciousness is like a tooth biting itself. Every avenue one can go down, I think, ultimately resolves in some sort of paradox. And, and this position is officially called Mysterianism, and it's a school of thought in philosophy of mind. Um, and I think the name of the school is great because it's really proposing the same thing that mystics have been saying for thousands of years. That is that not much can be said. It's the fact that they're mute that makes them mystics and not prophets. We think, we feel, we are, and then we stay silent, because any word would ultimately betray the truth. Okay, so we're getting close to the end, and I just want to wrap up this talk with a few words about the trivium, and that is in its relation 
to what, for lack of a better term, has been called the truth movement. Over the past few decades, there's been a rise of semi-professional teachers and writers and speakers who all deal with all manner of issues from spiritual liberation to uh, government conspiracies to the health of psychedelics, gun control, or astrotheology or whatever. If you're here, then I doubt you need me to name names. Um, and of course, they all come at these different issues from different angles and with different levels of credibility. Now, it's important to say that what I'm about to say isn't meant as an attack on these people. I, I, I love many, though not, of course, all of these teachers, but I also think it's very important to be honest with them and ourselves and give them a dose of their own medicine, namely the Trivium. I will name no names, because my intention here isn't to shit on anyone. I just find that the more time I spend looking into stuff related to the Trivium, the more I find that some of its expounders are among its most egregious offenders. After all, it was you who told me never to believe in anything anyone said. It was you who said that I should look into everything I was taught and take no man or woman as an authority. And so here I'm doing that. It was you who said one of the hardest things on the planet to do is to admit that you were wrong. And so when it comes to this very specific issue, this is where we need to start being serious. We need to get healthy in the grammar domain so that serious people will take us seriously. Otherwise, we're just talking past each other. Now, what irritates me the most is when I hear all manner of appeals to etymology made to prove this point or that point, but almost always these are unproven folk etymologies totally theoretical etymologies, or worst of all, etymologies based in quote-unquote green language. For those of you who don't know, green language is this alchemical idea that words have encoded meanings in them. Uh, so for example, soldier is really just soul dire, a person whose soul is meant to die. Or even Soul dire, as in the sun, soul, dies. Another uh, example would be money, which allegedly hides the words mon, or mono, for one, and I, for the I. So money is the one I, or the government-issued replacement thereof. So why is all this bunk? Well, I'm sorry to say it, but nobody quote-unquote invented the English language one day, or any language for that matter. Languages form, change, and dissolve organically and extremely chaotically. They're not engineered. They can be manipulated in a sort of Orwellian fashion with today's forms of mass media, but no council of dark occultists got together and decided which words we're all going to use and which words mean what. Unless we're talking about people who write grammars and dictionaries, but as we've seen, their attempts at controlling the culture through prescriptive means has hardly succeeded. Words are born and die every day. And these days, it's Webster's and Oxford's job to describe what's in use, not what should be in use. That project failed long ago. So then, how are words formed? Well, there are no hard and fast rules. Like I said, it's an organic process of exchange, innovation, mutation, and so forth. If we take money, for example, we can trace its usage through time. Money comes from the French monnaie, which makes sense because most English aristocrats who had any sort of dealing with money spoke French. Now, where did the French get monnaie before them? Well, it naturally came in from the Latin, from the Roman goddess Moneta, in whose temple the imperial treasury was kept. Now, let's say we didn't know any of these facts already. Well, 
Okay, then what significance could mon and I have to a purely Latin speaker? Well, mons means a hill in Latin, not one, and I is an English word. The, the Latin is oculus, um, and it doesn't even work as a personal pronoun, I, either, because in Latin the first person singular pronoun is, is ego. So, you see, the whole thing crumbles apart if you know what you're dealing with. You can do this with any word allegedly made up of green language. Trust me. In fact, I challenge anyone to bring me a single piece of relevant green language, and if I can't break it down for you according to regular rules of linguistics or you know the historical traces, the vowel shifts and the like, I'll publicly admit I was wrong. I'm not saying you're not being manipulated, I'm just saying this isn't one of those ways. Now, I could do this for a whole lecture, and I won't because it's nitpicking and it isn't constructive. But another point against green language is this. What about people who don't speak English? Why is English so central as a demonic language? Uh, why not French? Why not Arabic or Mandarin or Hindi? Uh, are their languages also flooded with green language? If not, uh, then are they well beyond the network of mind control? There are just so many problems with looking at words this way, and I think that all it can do is proliferate paranoia. You end up getting as many nefarious scenarios out of a word as you can imagine word permutations within it. Satanic reptilians are not in control of your words. You are. You are. If you decide that the word toast meant fork tomorrow, and vice versa, and then you went and taught that to the other people you hung out with, then there you have it. You've exercised a creative act of word magic. It's, it's for this reason that even the real etymology of a word doesn't really have much impact on how that word might be used or interpreted today. The fact that money comes from moneta is unbeknownst to virtually everyone, and thus it doesn't affect how most people perceive the modern word. This is actually a problem that I personally face all the time, having been in school studying Greek and Latin for many years. I often conflate modern English words with their ancient sense. Uh, coloring the way that these words are generally used now with the sense that they carried in a bygone age. And I lose people along the way. That These can make for good, nice uh, poetry or, or puns that are called figura etymologica, but it ultimately obfuscates what I'm trying to say. It's like I'm talking to myself. The reality is words change. The word faggot doesn't mean now what it meant 15 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 2,000 years ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, faggot and fascist have the same Latin root, fasces, uh, a bundle of sticks, and that just goes to show how much words can change, or how much cross-linguistic cognates can differ in meaning. If I call you a faggot, I'm not calling you a bundle of sticks, or a fascist, or a homosexual. Chiefly, I'm calling you a contemptible person. That's it. Words change in their meaning, and they change in pronunciation, in popularity, in infamy, and so on and so forth. And the processes by which these changes occur are far too complex to be explicitly controlled. So please, please drop this fantasy of green language. Yes, Alchemists used decnomen in the Middle Ages, but that doesn't mean dark occultists have invented and populated our language with sorcerous verbal shrines to their evil without any of us more philologically inclined folks noticing it. I'm not a shill. I'm not a disinfo agent. I'm not some arm of the establishment come to derail your quest for truth. I'm just trying to get people who advocate for the trivium to use the trivium. And I don't want to hear people who have never studied an iota of Greek or Latin or any sort of Indo-European linguistics calling other people blind sheeple because they disagree with the premise of green language. If that's how you're going to operate, then I suggest you rewind this talk and go back to the section on ad hominems. And if that doesn't change your mind, then stop pretending you value the disciplines of grammar, logic, and rhetoric because clearly you don't, and that will become evident 
to your more critical listeners. Last word in passing, government does not mean mind control. Now, that doesn't mean that government isn't mind control. It just means that that meant suffix has nothing to do with the mens, the word for mind in Latin. Do you have any idea how many words end with meant in the English and French languages alone? Does cement have something to do with the mind? What about movement or moment or comment or department or equipment or the 600 other words that end in meant? These have no etymological link to the Latin word mens. I'm absolutely sick of hearing this bullshit, not because I disagree with the sentiment, but because that etymological link just isn't true, regardless of how I feel about government. So don't stack your deck. You don't need to make anything up to see how fucked up everything is today. I will gladly help anyone with any questions about etymology. You know, I'm not an authority myself, but I certainly have recourse to the right books and to the right people who are just like you and me. They're not Illuminati shills. They're just people who've dedicated their entire life to historical linguistics. And so they know a thing or two. Okay. So with all that said, I think I'm going to end this talk on the trivia. I'll have more to say on the subject in future lectures, uh, especially in regards to rhetoric. Uh, I think I'm going to put together a seminar while we're covering the Roman Empire, specifically called you are being lied to, uh, where we'll examine the figures of rhetoric in detail, and we'll see what it is exactly that makes a speech persuasive in, in spite of its ideological contents.